Welcome back, baseball family. This week, we're going to discuss no hitters, addressing YouTube comments, and baseball documentaries right now. Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes. And now, Baseball Together. Welcome back, baseball family, to another episode of the Baseball Together podcast. I'm Brig, and as per the huge, got the Brad man right here with me. Hey, Brad. Hey, Brig. How you doing? So good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking. Yeah. What's the weather in Phoenix? It's very, very hot today. Okay. Um, we had our first day, I believe it was our first day, up over like 105. I was driving oh. in a car without air conditioner today, and it was 108. My goodness. It's fantastical experience, I'll tell you. 108 in the car. Yep. With no air conditioning. so I was going to say, that's roof closed weather at Chase Field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is roof closed weather for sure. <laughs> but, that's awesome. Yeah, it was very hot though. But well, it's all in the beginning. What do you say? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, was, it was in the 80s here or something. It was just, oh, just we're nice. just warming it up. It was nice. <laughs> uh, let's get into some current events for our baseball family here on their commute this fine day. Reed Detmers. Of the Angels. He threw a no-no Tuesday night against the Rays. Um, there were only two strikeouts over 108 pitches. And that that is not something you see very often. Talk about a team effort. Yeah. Usually that's the thing is usually guys when they throw no-nos, they're dealing, right? They'll strike out seven, mm-hmm. eight, nine, even ten, sometimes up and to fifteen so, yeah. guys, right? But no, it was everybody got behind him. I think. I don't know. It's a little scary down there in Anaheim for the rest of the league, Brig. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, we yeah. talked last week or two weeks ago about how the Angels, you said they got moxie. Um, yeah. They're going to maybe hang around and continue to be a problem. But I'm going to ask you this one more time, Brig, before we get too late in the season. Are the Angels potentially for real? Yeah. I think they could be. I think in they fact, could be. Brig, I'm going to maybe overreact. And I'm going to say they're my new front runner for the World Series. What? Yes. And let me show you why. For those watching you on you watching on YouTube, um, you're going to be able to see this. But I'm going to explain this to you. So this was after Detmers threw that no hitter, right? Yeah, and I might yeah. be, like I said, I might be overreacting to this. But this is a big deal to me. And Brig, we've talked about this. This yeah. is a big deal with teams that win. You don't have to be the best team on the field. What you do need, though, is chemistry the entire yeah. team stood around and waited for detmers during his post game interview now this is from i believe this is from baseballer the baseballer account on it, on facebook and instagram so yeah. this sport is perfect but i was like no 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 this team is special because that doesn't always happen in fact that i feel like that rarely happens guys standing around waiting for somebody especially a rookie right that's the best to get off of the, the field. story yeah so this mm-hmm. team has something special. They have chemistry that you need to win games. And I feel like that's the difference now than the last almost, I mean, two decades since they won a World Series. Exactly. Well, and it's it's that's the kind of stuff that's going to carry you through the doldrums and the rough times mm-hmm. and the injuries and everything else is that that sort of cohesion. This is the X Factor stuff. Yeah. And I think that's, for me, that's why it, it comes down to personnel and if you have to drive it to personnel you gotta pin it on otani you Mm -hmm. have to right i mean the guy started off the season horribly in an absolute slump but he was still like positive enough that a he was gonna break out of it because he knew that he was because he's that good but the way he was like i gotta get out of this is he's giving his bat cpr everybody's standing around laughing the next thing you know he goes on a tear like he does and now the angels are winning every game yep and that again freed up mike trout no more pressure. Mm-hmm. He's not hurt. Life is good. Life yep. is good in Anaheim right now. And Anthony Rendon remember how to play baseball? He, <laughs> which is which is great. It's great. It's scary. So he scary still looks like AOS. Jafar. He still looks like Jafar, and he but always will. It and it's wonderful. He just, <laughs> I just don't think he ever ages. He's like he came out. He looked like Jafar. He's always <laughs> looked like Jafar. That's how it feels to me. You know? <laughs> We don't know how old he is. He He's as old as Jafar. There you go. All right. 
let's move over to Cincinnati because we still have no nos going on. Uh, the Reds, the Reds tossed a no no against Pittsburgh and lost. <laughs> they did. And I can't stop laughing. Well, so I, I got to tell you this. So the Reds kind of had like a good week last week. They won a few games yeah. and yeah. they were looking like, okay, maybe they're going to pull out of this thing. And I was paying attention to this game because Hunter Green is a great pitcher. He is right. very, very good. And so I was, I was paying attention to this, watching how he was doing, because I saw that he had a no-no going. I was like, oh, sweet. This is awesome. But then I was like, got late in the game, and I was like, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we've got a couple walks and a fielder's choice. The Pirates score a run. Rot roll. <laughs> that could be just enough. And sure enough, it was just enough, and the Pirates ended up yeah. winning the game without registering With a hit. One, one run, no hits. And Brad mm. informed me I was in a fit of giggles and just obnoxious <laughs> laughter. Uh, not to disparage anyone, just that I you don't see this very often. And Brad let me know that it happens more often than I was uh, previously aware. Brad, so you said I actually the last have one it. Was yeah, June twenty eighth of two thousand eight. Yeah. The Dodgers were no hit but one. I just and then you've got man. April twelfth, nineteen ninety two the Cleveland Indians at the time. And then July 1st, 1990, the Chicago White Sox were no hit and, and one Greg, That's four times in our lifetime. First, I was going to, I was just going to say that's, that's nuts. It's not, it's not even <laughs> once in a generation. It's like, Oh, and then you've got the Tigers on April 30th, 1967. And then the Cincinnati Reds were on the winning side, April 23rd, 1964. But there's no record of any before that. Ooh, that's so weird. So what is that? Like six or eight total ever? Six total. And yeah, I right. and I wonder if it's um if before is because of the, like they changed the way hits are scored. You know, like yeah. like I said, this one was a walk and a, a couple walks and a fielder's choice is what led to that run. So maybe it had something to do with the way they scored errors, fielder's choice, things like that. Before right. that, that it didn't happen because it's almost like. You got on base and it was a hit, or you got on base and it was a walk or a hit by pitch or whatever. So right. I wonder if that's why, and because they changed things. But it goes back to 1964. It's happened six times now. That's amazing. Well, and speaking of official scorekeeping, there were some shenanigans in Southside Chicago this week. So uh, <laughs> both sides, both sides of the ball are like, how in the world is that not an error? Um, <laughs> but I guess we'll give the guy a hit instead. <laughs> That happens sometimes, so, like especially you'll especially get home cooking because that's like what it was, the Mariners, a lot of it. yeah, the Mariners are playing uh, the Mets this weekend, and there was a really hard hit ball. I think it was at Adam Frazier, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh dang, that's a tough play. They're gonna give him an error on that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. A little bit of home <laughs> cooking, but all right. But anyway, so we have to talk about combined no nos one more time, just. Wow, we're on the topic of no hitters. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, Brad, is <laughs> it is a combined no no for you anything special at all? If it is, is it does it how does it compare to, to a complete game no hitter for you personally? Um, I honestly so this one with the Reds, I mean, technically, I don't even, I don't know how much of a no hitter it was because the Reds pitched eight innings. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Hunter Green went seven and a third, whatever reliever is, I can't remember off the top of my head, went two thirds of an inning, and he was the one responsible for the run. So if I think if if Hunter Green hadn't had his pitch count so high at that point, they would have kept him in. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe they would end up winning the game. I don't know. But that feels like more of a no hitter than some of the ones we've seen because we the Mets had a had a combined no hitter earlier this year. Right. Right. Which now, was their Reed, first in franchise history or something like that, right? It, it's got to be their first combined because they had guys. That's what like I mean. Nor, first combined, yeah. 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 Um and, and it makes sense because it's something we're gonna see way more often now. Reed Detmers yeah. threw 108 pitches, and I feel like that was uh, that was mad in the top. Yeah. It, like really throwing a bone like, okay, hey, you've got two pitches to end this game or you're coming out because I'm not yeah. letting you get up above 110 for totally. sure. You know, we're kind of playing with things a little bit going 108. I don't, I, I bet Madden was not loving that. 
I totally believe you. I think you're absolutely right. But that's why we're going to see way more combined no-nos, and it's going to be a com- it's going to be more common. It's going to be something that's a little more socially accepted. But this is something that I feel like I am going to be a curmudgeon about for a very long time because it is way easier for a starting pitcher to go six innings of no-hit baseball with three innings of relievers getting three guys out at a time. Yep. I'm not yep. now to say that it's easier doesn't mean I don't think we're going to see it. But more it's often. easy. It's not easy total. Right. Yeah. It's easier, not easy. Right. So because yes. if, if you're throwing six innings of no hit ball, you've only gone through the order twice. Right. Most likely. And, and the sixth inning is when I, everybody starts to really pay attention. That's yeah. when things, yeah, the magic turns, right. And just got to display all their, their mojo. So Brad, we got to switch over and talk about, <clears throat> excuse me. we got to talk about Baseball therapy, because we, I mean, you were on the couch, I, or I was on the couch, you were helping yeah. me through it. I got some concerns with Yelly and Belly, and uh, and then Yelly hits for the cycle. <laughs> he did. Yes, he did. It was awesome. He got a stand-up triple. Did you see Did you see it? I sure did. Yeah, I was watching the game, and I was like, oh, man. And then he really was, like, cooking around second base, and he just walked into second or into third base. I was like, yep. look at that. That is a stand-up triple for the cycle. That's right. Very nice. He likes to beat up on the Reds, apparently. Well, everybody likes to beat up on the Reds right now, but uh, <laughs> there are certain guys. There are certain guys who play well against certain teams. Like Kyle Seager is always he always played well against the Rangers, especially in Texas. Christian yeah. Yelich apparently plays well against the Reds, which you can't blame. Him, but I mean, what are you gonna do? It's fantastic. But Brig, I have some updates for you since you okay. uh, were on the couch talking about Yelly and Belly during baseball therapy. Let's talk about Christian Yelich first. So since that episode came out on May the 3rd, um, he has had 42 at-bats, has gotten 14 hits, good enough for a 333 batting average, two home runs, a triple, four doubles, six walks, 10 strikeouts, one hit by pitch. And granted, in only one double play with Brig, might I add, a stolen base. It would appear that Yelly has learned how to or figured out how to play baseball again. Whoa! Christian Yelich is, is back. Yes! And it's exciting. It's very exciting. You know how it makes me feel? How does it make you feel? You remember when the NC Dinos won the championship and <laughs> yeah. they got the sword out? Yeah. That is how I feel in time <laughs> right now. <laughs> amazing i love it now cody bellinger on the other hand has not remembered how to play baseball quite yet okay. he has had 47 at bats with just nine hits which is a 192 average he has had one home run a triple four doubles three walks five rbis struck out 16 times right, right. um so he's still trying to work through it still fighting it but i i maintain that his injury in the 2020 world series Mm-hmm. With that, he did that that elbow bump and messed up his yeah. shoulder. I maintain that that has not gotten back to full strength. That yeah. a shoulder injury can linger for a very long time, despite having surgery. Right, right, Brig. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know about you that. can vouch. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I th- I think that's the problem with him. Honestly, he actually I I saw an overlay. I was watching on ESPN a couple weekends ago, yeah. and they showed that he changed his bat his stance from 2020 to 2021, and now he's gone back to his 2020 batting stance. Used to he had his so originally he had his bat flat over his yeah. shoulder, but then last year he propped it straight up in the air, and then now it's back flat again over his shoulder. He's having more success. He's doing better this year than he was last year, but obviously batting sub two hundred is not optimal, especially for a guy who can play at his level. Yeah, no, it's bad actually. But I will say this, Brig. Say it, Brad. Christian Yelich has over eleven hundred games under his belt. Yep, in his career, Cody Bellinger is getting is approaching 650. Half. So he's got time. Yeah. He's got time to get it figured out. I don't yeah. think the Dodgers are going to trade him. I don't think they're going to send him down. I think they're going to let him work through it at the big league level and I think he's going to figure it out. Billy will be back. It's just going to take some time, I think. I think that's okay. And he's got the right club to do it, honestly. I think Oh, he's right. got a ton they're... of support around him. Yeah, and they're and they're gonna hang tough with him too. So yeah, because they can, they can. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Well, let's let's move on a little bit um, and talk about bad baseballs. Blue Jays pitcher Yimmy Garcia, he, he says that these are the worst baseballs 
ever. It's as bad as they've ever been, worse he's ever used. Um, Josh Donaldson was hit by a pitch this week, and there's a lot of question, speculation, slash maybe some finger pointing about whether it was on purpose or not. Oh, because it wasn't the pitch before that inside, too. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, it sure yeah. was. <laughs> yeah. So, and a whole bunch of other ones, too. Like, this wasn't just, I don't know, it wasn't an anomaly. Right. Um, so yeah, what this is not the first time we've heard this though, right? No, Slippery, it's not. And I, overstretched. Honestly, yeah, I have a theory because one of the things they say is they're really slippery. They have small laces, so it's hard to grip them. But I have a theory about this: is that since 2020, and that's really when players started really complaining about the quality of the baseball, right? Yeah. Um, they've been burning through balls like crazy. Yeah. Like crazy used to you would they would go through they'd strike a guy out throw the ball around pitcher get the ball back and go back to it there would be a ground ball and they would make the play at first base throw it around pitcher would get the ball if there was something on it he didn't like it then they'd throw it out but brig after every single batter the balls are going out now they used to go through they used to prepare 12 dozen baseballs per game right they've got to be doing at least 15 to 16 now there's 1550 usually calculated across all 30 teams in a single day by the way that's a an average 120 baseballs per game so that's how many they go through but they prepare though oh i see they've got to prepare that's what i'm saying they've got to be preparing probably 15 to 16 dozen yeah baseballs per game when used to it was 12 dozen baseballs a game so then they would have 24 about 24 extra right so now, mm-hmm. I don't. I feel like they're burning through too many balls, and now yeah. the production line is like the quality right. of of ball is dropping because they're trying to produce so many more to keep up. Yeah, right. And that's yeah, I just what I looked think it the up. Is. I just looked it up. It is one twenty between eighty four and one twenty as of twenty twenty one, October okay. twenty twenty one. All right. Uh, that's, that's how, how many, many that's how many they go through they use right yeah yeah because yeah. i talked to an umpire in 2016 who said that in minor league baseball they prepare 10 dozen baseballs for a game and then in yeah. major league baseball they prepare 12 dozen just to makes have. sense so uh, no, that makes that, sense that's what that's I think a lot of freaking is. baseballs man it is a lot of baseballs like i think it's excessive still it's getting excessive. rid of baseballs because like if <laughs> if it's still because of COVID protocols, like Ow. if you don't want to have baseballs quote unquote contaminated, yeah, then they can't be throwing it around. Right. It's right. Been a You've got to just the whole out, plant. Yeah. Get it out of play. Like it's all just optics. That's all it is. Yeah. And it's driving me crazy. If you can bring down the number of baseballs used, you won't have to pump them out quite so fast. The quality will go up again. And you won't have this problem. And part of the problem might be that there's not sticky stuff, like residual sticky stuff on the ball. Right. Totally. Yep. But at the same time, like, I don't know. I feel, I feel like that's part of what's contributing to it though. So and I wonder why, why do they not recycle the ball? Like, so this pitcher on this at bat doesn't like the way that ball feels. Okay. Give it, get it out of there. Uh-huh. Put it back in the bucket. I and think then they roll do. it back in there. Do they do that? I think so. Yeah, because like I remember, like this was a few years ago. You know, you watch the ball bounce in the dirt. The catcher would hand it to the umpire to check it, and, and while he's checking it, or before he checks it, he'd hand the catcher another ball. Yeah, yeah, he'd check it. Yeah. Oh, not too bad. He put it back in the in his pouch. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So I think they do, or at least they were. I don't know if they still are anymore. If they're just like it's been used, get it out of there. I don't know either because I feel like. I mean that would be an immediate optimization tool. Right? To just, yeah. You're like, yeah. Just so he didn't like it that minute. So maybe the next guy is not gonna have a problem. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's it's what I would strange. say. Anyway, yeah. uh speaking of pitching, we gotta go to car to the Cardinals. Albert Pujols made his pitching debut, and this is significant for absolutely no reason, other than it's way fun to talk about. Um, he's going to the Hall of Fame. Everybody knows that. It's a no-doubter award. But he gave up two home runs, Brad, four earned runs. He walked a guy. He had three hits through the whole thing. He did get three outs. And now he has a career ERA of 36. (laughs) (laughs) I 
<laughs> I think that's that's so funny. Um, it's got to go on his plaque. It's, it's, it it's to. got to go. One <laughs> one appearance or however many appearances that. One pitching. one ever. Well, I know. I'm it. saying, like, I don't know if I don't know if he wants to pitch later on this season. Maybe oh, bring right, his ERA right, right. down a little bit, you know. But <laughs> with this 54 mile an hour lob, it was awesome. <laughs> he looked more like he knew what he was doing than Brett Phillips did the first time he got out there. Dude, Brett Phillips right? looks lost in the Brett sauce. Phillips is like and continues to be the position player of choice. For the race to toss in a blowout, I yep. think he's pitched three or four times this year. I yeah, I think so. <laughs> anyway, I I think so. There's two things that, real quick that I think were the best of, about this. First off, okay. you know he asked to go out there because yes. they're kind of look around. He's like, I'll, I'll go. I haven't pitched yeah. before. I'll go pitch right. Yeah. And then Evan Longoria is like, he gets that hit. He's like, I want the ball. Give me that baseball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was just a base hit. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> i got a hit off albert pujols who yeah. else can say that they did <sighs> only three other guys That's or right. two other guys i mean <laughs> yeah and they both went yard uh <laughs> staying in, staying in st louis for one brief moment adam wainwright and yadi molina are now the winningest battery the winningest pitcher and catcher combination in mlb history now this is team wins this is not the pitcher's statistic wins and losses that's not what we're talking about right. wainwright has 188 wins in the win column as a pitcher but the team has won 203 times now when they have been the battery starting the game that set that beats the record this the old record was set in 1963 by none other than warren span and dale crandall dell excuse me dell crandall who played together from 49 to 63 that's how long this has been. I think that's awesome. So of course, course it's going to be Wayne Wright and Molina. <laughs> of course it is. Because they're the oldest guys in the game, them and Pujols, yeah. right? Yep. Wayne's <laughs> 40, then, right? And Yachty's, well, I think Yachty's, what, 39? 65, yeah, and, and it's yeah, his 19th about. season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looks good for 65. He still plays really good Maybe baseball. He's had some work done. I don't know. Just saying. Yeah. But... <laughs> it's all the tattoos. Uh, <laughs> hides. Anyway. So, Otani also, we got to move on a little bit. Otani, he hit his 100th career home run. And uh, the question is, where does this end? Obviously, uh, in, over his career. I mean, I, people, are what, people are wondering if a couple other players in the league, we're not going to mention them, um, are going to hit 50 this year mm -hmm. each. Um, but where does Otani end this season, and what does that mean for his career numbers? That's so this season, I could see him hitting 50 home runs this year. Yeah, me too. Especially since he can hit for an entire game, even in a National League park. Bingo. Uh, so I'm curious where he ends his career, honestly. At yeah. the clip, he's been hitting home runs since he's gotten healthy. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he was knocking on the door of seven hundred when it's all said. Whoa, seven hundred! Because at some point he's at some point he's not going to have to pitch anymore. They're going to just be like, "Well, you just want you to hit," and he'll be like, "Probably be fine with it, right?" Totally, because he can. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna put him close to seven hundred. I don't know if he'll I don't know if he'll reach it, but I yeah. think he'll be close. Well, so if he continues on this pace, so he, this is his fifth season in Major League Baseball. He is currently, how old is he right now? He was born in 94. I don't know. Do so the math on that one. 28. 28. Oh, wow. 28. He's got 101 as of right now, actually. Right, he's 27 That's... right now. He'll be 28 later this year. Huh. 700? Man. So you have to remember his first couple years he wasn't healthy. I know that's right? why he missed two seasons because of Tommy John. Yeah. So you can't say that he's averaged twenty home runs, and I think he has a, another fifteen years in him. You think he's got fifteen more? He could. After all the time he already played before he got to Major League Baseball. Yeah, modern medicine, man. That's true. So in twenty eighteen he hit twenty two. 2019 it was 18, 2020 was 7. 
Uh, he already has eight this season, by the way. And in, last year it was 46. So, wow, 46. He went from 22 to 46 in 2018 to 2021. That's amazing. Okay. He's got an efficient swing that I feel like is going to age really well. It's just so sweet. Mm -hmm. 700. Well, I like your opinion. I don't have one, but I'm glad to have yours. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Yes. Uh, is There's rumors going around that Wilson Contreras might be on the chopping block for trades. And I, we, for, let me just state my opinion. I can't okay. believe they didn't trade him before the season started. Like, I am surprised they didn't trade him last year when they shocked. traded everybody else. Right. I'm shocked that he's still in Chicago. Uh huh. Yeah. The end. Um, <laughs> so Jewel and I were talking about this the other day when I saw this come up. I was like, what would you give the Cubs hmm. for Wilson Contreras? And he was really specific about like a couple of relievers, maybe a prospect starter. I was like, well, they're going to want to catch her in return. So go ahead and send either Cal Raleigh or Luis Torrens. I don't care. Those are probably going to be the two that they'll want. So send one of them. I don't care because you're getting back Wilson Contreras. Yeah. And then honestly, just about three any other, like any three guys they want who aren't mm -hmm. named Julio Rodriguez, Kyle Jerry Lewis. Kalanick. Yeah. At this point, honestly, if they ask for Kelnick, they could have him. Mm. He's back down in Triple A right now. Got it. So, because you've got because you've got Jesse Winker, you got Julio Rodriguez, and you've yeah. got Mitch Haniger when he comes back, and and then Kyle Lewis is probably going to be platooning in the outfield to give somebody a day off when he comes back in a couple weeks. So you've got a full outfield. You could trade Kelnick if they want him. Wow. You can trade Matt Brash if they want him because George Kirby has proven he can pitch at the big league level. You could trade Emerson Hancock if you want. So I'm that's what I'm saying. As long as the guy isn't named Julio Rodriguez or pretty much George Kirby, like you can have any of the other young players if I'm getting Wilson Contreras back because he fills a massive, massive hole for the Mariners that has just been I'm an sure. absolute black hole in their lineup for the last three years. Because yeah. Tom Murphy is as streaky as they come. Like when he's hot, he's absolutely unstoppably hot. And and I love that. But then his lows are so, so, so bad that I'm like, this dude belongs in high A. Right. So like the Mariners need Wilson Contreras so bad that I was just like, just throw the kitchen sink at him, see what see what sticks, and <laughs> see if you can get him in Seattle because that's that's a guy the Mariners need <laughs> so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying uh, to think. I'm trying to think if 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 they traded him, would he go to a contender team as a as a domino guy, or would he go to a build like a build mode team who's trying to orchestrate? I think a comeback? it depends on who can offer the best for the Cubs. Yeah, right. Yeah, I don't I don't know that they would necessarily want to trade to a National League team because that could really come back and bite them, especially in the NL Central. Um, but no, I think it would be, be a team essential. that has, I think it would be a team that has a deep farm system. And that's one reason I was like looking at the Mariners, like this could be a really good trade for the Mariners and the Mariners have Harry Ford, who's a top catching prospect down in high A, I believe this season, by mm. the time Contreras is ready to be done being a full everyday catcher, Ford's going to be ready to go. Okay. It just makes good sense, Brig. That's all I'm saying. It just makes good business in baseball sense, Brad. You're right. <laughs> um, last thing, and then we'll take a break. Jake Odorizzi left the game Monday night on a stretcher. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it first of all, the game took forever to restart. You were saying it's, it's still like, delayed. I have. Is I it have still? It's still delayed? Yeah, I don't know exactly what's going on. Um, but it's been delayed for like an hour. I don't know if it's because of that or what, but I have on here that wow. it's delayed. That's astonishing. So, yeah, that is absolutely astonishing. So our thoughts go out to him and his club. We hope mm -hmm. everything's fine. Um, obviously, yeah, we hate to see that happen. It was a, it was kind of a mystery leg injury. He was coming off the mound, uh, going over to help at first base on a ground ball. And uh, it was the, his last step on the slope of the mound. 
and then he just he collapsed to the ground and he was in an, obviously in a ton of pain um yeah. and so it was yeah it was kind of strange because it didn't look like he broke anything it could be an acl it could be something i'm not going to speculate too much but uh yeah it, it wasn't a visible leg injury so not a compound fracture no yeah excellent like it could have been but yeah. <laughs> yeah right right oh and it didn't look like he rolled his ankle either so i don't know what happened it's a right big, big old mystery well we'll anyway. figure it out there are big answers to big mysteries. All right, baseball right. family, with that, we will take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to give you fantasy baseball updates. We got some comments from YouTube we want to go into, and then we're going to talk about documentaries we want to see for baseball. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I never get back with me. Root, root, root for the home ticket stay. Don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Shop kids' baseball strips. At 9plusss.com. Welcome back, baseball family. So as Briggs said before, we're going to get into our weekly fantasy baseball update, and then we're going to talk about some comments from YouTube. We've had a lot lately, and I want to address some of them because some of them are very good. Others are uh, very interesting, and one of them is just really funny. So let's start with fantasy baseball first. The Baseball Together Fantasy Baseball League uh, just finished week five, and uh, it was an interesting week to uh, say the least. Let's start with your team, Brig. Okay. So <laughs> Brig went, Brig, his team, Brigger Mortis, went up against Denise, Grace under fire. Um, Denise won that one 325 to 255. Yeah. I believe that was her first win of the season. Oh, no, no, no never mind. She, uh, she won two in a row. That's called two in a row. One more, and that's called a winning streak. Yeah, that's that before. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so Briggs Briggs high score was Ty France at 62. That's not going to get it done for you, Briggs, unless you're going up against Freddie Freeman, who scored 64. That was her high score. However, she also had DJ LeMayhew. Yeah, DJ was Yankee. awesome. Scored so 56 good. points, and then Wilson Contreras scored 51. So she was a little bit top heavy. Um, Briggs, you were, I guess, bottom she was heavy. More- yeah, yeah, she was a little more evenly distributed at the top, I guess. And you were top heavy with Ty France because Josh Donaldson was next with 37 points, and that's uh, that's pretty brutal. Let's go down to Zip and John. Zip won this one, his first win of the season, 418 to 362. John has been the highest scorer so far of the district. John is killing it. Marcus. He is. Uh, so this is his first loss of the season. Uh, actually, no, sorry, his second. He's three and two now. I should look at these before I say things, but anyways. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, John, his high score was Reese Hoskins with 89. Then he had Francisco Lindor with 46. Zip was a little more evenly distributed. Josh Bell, 61. Jose Altuve, 53. Aaron Judge, 52. Tim Anderson, 46. And of all guys, Martin Maldonado had 46. That dude's batting like under 100 right now, but he had a, he was four for 21, had a home run, a couple RBI, scored a couple runs. I'm sure he had a few putouts. That dude's yeah. a monster behind the plate. He is a back pick machine. So yeah. I'm sure that that helped his score quite a bit. And then we'll go to the big league Chupacabras. Uh, that's Jewel and then not another fantasy team. Uh, that's Jason. Jewel won that one 390 to 354. Four, uh, Jewel is four and one. Jason is three and two after this matchup. Jewel had Jared Walsh with ninety eight points. Whoa! And then his next guy was CJ Crone with fifty. CJ Crone's got to come back to earth at some point. This is not the CJ Crone we all have gone, grown to know, right? Nope, it's not. It's astonishing. Yeah, it is astonishing. But maybe he's just capitalizing from that thin air in Colorado. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway. Um, Jason's top player was Sean Murphy with the A's. Sean Murphy is most famous for his butt, to be completely honest. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah. That clip where he gets hit and sticks his butt out. That's That's him. That's Sean Murphy, the catcher for the A's. Um, His next best player, Nasty Nestor Cortez. 
I love Nestor Cortez. I've grown to love Nestor Cortez. He's so honest. great. Now that he's not playing for the Mariners. I'm a big Nestor Cortez fan. Yeah. Because he's, he's, he's figured himself out. He's doing so well. He is. Good for him. I'm happy for him. Then our last one, I went up against Tory. Uh, I'm the Manitoba Man Clowns. Went up against Tory Springfield Nuclear Power. Um, Tory won this one 378 to 346. Woo! I am now on a two game losing streak, three and two. Tory is three and two as well. Yeah. Uh, his top performer was Paul Goldschmidt with 83 points. My top performers tied Corey Seeger and Travis Darno with 50 points each. Jeez. Yeah. Not a good week for me. Not at all. But I'm surprised I only lost by what's that? 32? Yeah. So I guess points. that's. A week for he most guys. My but Nelson butt. Cruz, Nelson Cruz missed a lot of time with a with an injury. So I actually have some uh, roster moves pending because I forgot to make those moves today. So they are going to be pending until next week. <laughs> I forget every time. <laughs> so this is a little tip for you for those of you who are considering putting together a league for you and your friends. Um, it's nice to have your roster set for the week because then you don't have to worry about it. And everybody's everything's all going to come out in the wash. Starting pitchers are going to throw five to six innings a week, right? Relievers are going to throw potentially five to six innings a week. So pitchers yeah. all come out in the wash. Your yeah. players all come out in the wash because everybody's going to play five to six games a week, whatever. The problem is with that is that once – that player starts a game on Monday, you cannot edit your roster. We've all run into problems with it. So the playing field is even, right, as far as that goes. But it yeah. is really frustrating when you have a guy like Nelson Cruz who misses the second half of the week and only ends up with 18 points and yeah. ends up being a big problem. So that's not something I would recommend as if you're putting a, together. You're right. Don't make it a rule. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um Anyway, so let's move on and let's talk about some YouTube comments here, Brig. We have, like I said, we have a few good ones that came through. This one came through two days ago about uh, when we were talking about Baseball Zen. Uh, it says, Baseball Zen is the most poorly sound designed thing I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not even joking when I say I'm certain most of the sounds are stolen from Minecraft. That's from <laughs> Anders Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> even the rain? Because I find that the rain ones are so satisfying to me. Um, well, I like, like the rain because it the actually sounds tarp. Yeah, I was gonna say you can hear it coming down on the tarp. I find yeah. that one really relaxing, but I, f I fall me asleep too. to rain sounds every night. Yeah, me too. So, well, not every night, but I like it. I don't know. I will. I will still say though the the chalk cart thing with the wobble is, still sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard, and always will. That is a terrible sound. I do not like that one. Uh, question, Brad. Do you do you think do you have you ever played Minecraft? <laughs> oh yeah, I play Minecraft all the time. Oh, okay, yeah, so I've never played, play played Minecraft. So can, is can you verify this? Is that true? Um, is it honestly? You see what I he's keep, saying? I keep video game sounds down. Oh. Um, the rain on Minecraft, like yeah, it probably does sound like that. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel like it's a problem. Um, mostly what you hear on Minecraft, like what I hear is either like the ruffling, the <laughs> when you're like mining something or like a, <laughs> when you're taking damage, stuff like that. Gotcha. So I don't know. Maybe they were stolen from Minecraft. Maybe the guys on Minecraft, like I don't, cause I don't think it's eight bit sound. Cause it's not eight bit <laughs> music. Probably. Right. So I don't know. Huh. I don't, I have no moral authority to speak on Minecraft whatsoever. I don't know. I so thought, I thought that was idea. interesting. That was an interesting comment. Interesting. Here's one for you, Brig. So this was on uh, the clip from the perfect game in Japan. Yeah. Uh, this is a, this is a longer one. You want to go ahead and do this one? Sure, I'll read it for us. August Hayek. Hayek? Hayek, maybe? Sorry, August. All right, it says, yes, MLB balls are somewhat bigger and more slippery. Also, they say the MLB balls are comparatively poorly made with their centers of gravity off the real centers to the extent that sensitive pitchers can feel it the japanese say this is what caused otani and darvish's injuries i forgot who it was but a few years ago an mlb pitcher who played in japan at ichiro's last game perhaps really liked the japanese ball and he brought it back to the u.s to negotiate with major league baseball 
to improve their quality in order to lessen pitchers' injuries. I don't know what happened afterward, though. As for Roki Sasaki, he was not drafted by any of the Central League teams in Japan since his physique was not well-developed Is or in his high school like Otani, Darvish, uh, Matsuzaka, and others were. Um, Chiba Lote, his team, did a really good job, though, because in the first year, they only trained the physique, his physique, excuse me, without using him in a game even once while keeping him in the first team for the whole year. During this period, his lower body was strengthened and he made his amazing debut this year. Well, that's like insider baseball. That was all fantastic information. I read yes. that and I was like, that's amazing. I love it. Thank you so much, Thanks, August. August. And Brig, yeah. there's more. There's more because we were talking about the baseball today, and I feel like this is fitting. So he actually responded again with this comment, and he said, I found more info. The difference between Japanese professional baseball and Major League Baseball, the Japanese hardball weight approximately 141.7 grams, size approximately 22.9 centimeters. Major League Baseball weight approximately 148.8 grams, size approximately 23.5 centimeters. So it was like we talked about actually yeah. in that video that the Major League Baseball ball is a little bit bigger and could be leading to these uh, these elbow injuries like we talked about. It's heavier too, yeah. It says, according to the rules, the weight of the ball is 141.7 to 148.8 grams, and the size or circumference is 22.9 to 23.5 centimeters. Professional baseball in Japan is the smallest size within this regulation, and Major League Baseball is the largest size within this regulation. Not only the size, but also the texture is different. Major League Baseball is more slippery than Japanese balls. The height of the seams is also different and is higher in Major League Baseball. I don't know if that's because a lot of guys are talking about lower seams on the ball. Yeah, I don't know. And then the skin is used. uh, The skin used for the ball is cowhide in both Japan and the United States, which... Uh, I'm pretty sure it's horse hide in the United States. At least it has been historically horse hide. Historically, yeah. Um, while the while in Japan, the efficient of restitution is fixed, but is not fixed in Major League Baseball. So there are variations. I think what that is is the coefficient for um, uh, friction, which means uh, how how tough the surface is. Yeah. Uh, how much how much friction you can generate. Also, pitching mounds are harder in the, in the States than in Japan, which causes more weight on the pitcher's arms, causing more injuries. So I thought that was excellent information given to That's us by great. August. So you can take what with that what you would like. Um, Major League Baseball, I don't know if what's been going on over the last few years, if they've necessarily taken the precautions that they need to to address the injuries, because see, we've seen way more injuries in baseball over the last... 20 years yeah. for pitchers like elbow injuries than I yeah. feel like what we saw before because before it was like it's your rotator cuff is the injury right, right? but now it's the yep. elbow and you know part of that is guys are throwing a whole lot harder now and it's like throw as hard as you can until you can't anymore and then we'll deal with it right and younger and they're starting younger and they're training mm-hmm. harder younger and they're overusing their arms sooner so yeah some of that as well but yeah gearing up to throw a bigger ball that might have something to do with yeah. it could be. Yep. I like, that. I like that. And so here we have, we have our last one here, Rick. This one, I w- I wanted to address this um, a couple weeks ago, but I okay. forgot. And I apologize because it definitely deserves our attention. Um, this is DC Toon Time. You want to read this one for us, Brig? I do. DC Toon Time says, Castellini looks like a mafia goomba. What a goof. He's going to find out, quote, where are we going to go? Quote. <laughs> End quote. That was that was in response to the Castellini video, and I yeah. thought that was the perfect response from a Reds fan. <laughs> yeah, because he does. Yeah, he does look like a he mafia does. goomba. He looks like he knows where Jimmy Hoffa's buried. <laughs> That's what he looks like. He might. He just might. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well. So let's take a quick break. Actually, before we do, go ahead and comment on the videos. If you had to leave a good comment that's informational or funny, we're gonna give we'll give you a shout out. I want to start doing this more often because we're being we've yeah. been getting a lot more really good comments on YouTube or uh, drop something in the mailbag for us as well on baseballtogether.com. Uh, with that, let's take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to talk about 
baseball documentaries that we want to see. The non Sports Podcast is the home of sports talk for everyone. Every other week, you can catch David and Jason as they talk about all things sports. From current events to classic moments and everything in between, you can find the non Sports Podcast on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Welcome back, baseball family. This is a highly anticipated segment between Brad and I. We we have long discussed what documentaries we hope get made. And I'm going to caveat this by saying we have documentaries we plan to make. We, we want to make documentaries. Uh, and we're working toward that. So if you want to support us in that adventure, and if you want to get in on that, um, then you can drop us a line on Patreon. We have different tiers that will allow you to support us for $5, 10 and $15. They're different kind of packages, and that will enable us to not only keep doing what we're doing here, but also to make documentary films that we hope to do in the future. Anyway, there are a number of documentaries out there about baseball. We love plenty of them. However, there are some topics that, are, that have gone unexplored. And Brad and I have put together a list, just three each, this day, this day, three, we limited it to three each, documentaries we would like to see made or or would maybe like to have a hand in making one day. So Brad, why don't you go ahead and give us your first one, um, documentaries you want to see. Okay, the first one is actually, I'm going to go with a docu-series, Brig. Ooh, oh, yes. Um, so <laughs> I, think, I think this would be really cool to see, um, and it's different positions and roles around a major league baseball team. Now this is not front office jobs. Like I don't, I don't care in this series. I don't care what the GM does. I don't care what the assistant GM does. I don't care what the scouts do. What I want to see is what is it like to be a relief pitcher? Right. What do they do before the games? How do they prepare? What's it like out in the dugout or out in the bullpen? Right. Like yep. you see them throwing seeds at each other and goofing around all kinds of stuff, right? Like I want to, I want to be behind a camera in the bullpen, seeing what exactly is going on, what is said. What's it like being the bullpen catcher? What is the what is the bullpen catcher's job, other than to stroke the ego of the relief pitcher while he's warming up, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, what does the bench coach do? What exactly is the bench coach's job during the, during the game? I always joked that the bench coach is the babysitter, is the dugout babysitter, right? But yeah. a bench coach does a whole lot more than that. There's a, a bench course. coach has a significant job. And then the other one I want to see is um, – actually, there's two. One of them is a clubby, a clubhouse attendant. Yep. Because that's a cool job for anybody who doesn't know. Sure. That's yeah. an awesome job. And if, if you want to work in baseball and you want to be involved but behind the scenes – look into being a clubhouse attendant because it's a great job pays really well um and then the other one i actually got to talk to somebody who had this job with the twins she was the press box receptionist Ooh! so you walk out of the you walk out of the elevator into the press area like like where like the owner's box is where the press goes to sit and all the broadcasters and she has yeah. a desk sitting right there pointing you to where you're supposed to go this woman had been with the twins for like, I want to say like 60 something years. Whoa. 50, 50 or 60. I don't remember. She was, she'd been there forever. She took it as a wow. part-time job and it just stuck. She was with them forever. Like to the point that she actually had a house down in Florida where like next to their stadium so that she could go down for spring training and participate and be around some of the team with spring training. Get out of town. Yeah, I wrote a story and I'll send it over so you can read it because it was yeah, an awesome cool. interview. It was, it was a lot of fun. I talked to her for like legit like four innings when I was at, the, at a Twins game. It was rad. Put it so, in the show notes in the description too so that people can see. Put the post may, Yeah, maybe I'll, oh, no, I think I'll put it on baseballtogether.com. I got to find there it. There you go. And I'll put yeah. it on baseballtogether.com and I'll put it in the show notes and, uh, yeah. and maybe I'll tweet it out or something too. I don't know. Just so you guys yeah. can find it easily. But that's, that's what I want to uh, That's what I want to see in a docuseries. That would be a cool docu series i talked to a woman at chase field like i don't know a year and a half ago or so and she had been a ticket 
seller at the ticket booth for 25 years. Was that was that when uh, we were trying to figure out how to get the, the tickets off your phone because your phone was going to die? Yep. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what it was, actually. I forgot That's about right. that part of the story. <laughs> That's a true story because they only do electronic story. tickets now. So Briggs' That's phone right. was nigh into death, and we were trying to figure out how to get him transferred from his phone to my phone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> talking to the ticket taker. <laughs> and then I bamboozled our way past the cop into the team store. Just about. Yeah. I mean, I just talked him talked him into it, but yeah. it was great. Um, okay, I'm going to go with mine next. And a. Uh, Okay, so let me just let me just I won't preface it. I want to see uh, a docu series as well, Brad. Thank you for all right establishing that that is a possibility here. I want to see a docu series. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to see what it's like to play baseball from childhood all the way to the show in Latin America. And I want to go. I want to see. I want to see kids hitting rocks with sticks, kind of stuff, or like. Um, like Mariana Rivera's story about you know playing with a cardboard, cardboard glove, glove in Panama. I want to see all. I want to see that in the first episode around Venezuela, Panama, uh, in the Caribbean, all of it. And then I want to go. Uh, and each episode is like in innings, and all it goes all the way to the ninth inning where we get the guys playing the bigs. That's what I want to see. I want to see what yeah. it's like to the draft. I want to see what it's mm -hmm. like. Uh, with the families, I want to see what it's like in training facilities. I want to see who's getting schmoozed by which uh, teams and what the scouting teams look like down there. Is it different? Is it handled differently than it is here? You know, all of it. How much is regulated? What's implied? What's under the table? I want all the dirt. I want it all to come out. And I want questions left unanswered at the end as well so that there's more research in the back. That's what I want. That's awesome, uh, especially since the pipeline to get from, like you said, from like Little League to the bigs in the Caribbean and the Latin and all the Latin countries is so, so, so very different than it is here in the States than like what yep. you or I would have experienced had we yeah. had the ability to do so. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so that, I, that's fascinating. I think that's awesome. That's what I want to see. What is it like there? Okay, Brad, what's your, willing, what's your next one? Well, I was gonna say I'd be willing to travel with you to make such a such a documentary. <laughs> Twist my arm to go to the Caribbean brig. Okay. Twist it. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Anyway. Curacao? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want to go to Puerto Rico? Okay. Um, um, okay. <laughs> all right. The next one I want to see. This one I feel like it would be difficult to make just because of trying to find information and uh, footage is essentially non-existent. You would just be a bunch of interviews and photos and stuff, basically, and, and recreations. But I want I want to see something about the dead ball era because it's fascinating to me. It's nice. such it's completely different baseball. It's almost a completely different game. Right now, I'm reading this book called How Baseball Happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the one I got. I was out in South Carolina and Brig actually bought that for me. It was nice enough to buy that book so I could read it. It's taken me this long to get to it because I've been reading other things, but it's fascinating. It's really interesting learning about the origins of baseball and how different it was during the dead ball era. And I, I would honestly include the very beginning of the game, like what even led into dead ball baseball. Right. Right. Because one of the things it talks about is that there was a team that did a world tour similar to what the Savannah bananas just finished up. And, mm -hmm. uh, and everywhere they went, people were like, Oh yeah, we have a game just like this. Right. We have that ball game. Yeah. Like we have cricket everywhere. We have rounders. Well, it, was, we have... Places that it, it was beyond just cricket and rounders though. So mm. there was always somewhere. Some, somebody was like, yeah, yeah, we got a game like this. So that I think is really interesting. So I would, I want to see like the origins of baseball through the dead ball era. Right. And then Very end cool. with, end with Babe Ruth comes in, disrupts everything, and completely changes the game. Changes everything, yeah. So that I think that wow, would be really interesting to watch. Wow. Very cool. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know who needs to do that one is Ken. Ken Burns got to do that one. Yeah, you're probably right. 
he, he's got the he's got the know how. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Okay. Um. All right. My next one is a little less intense, actually. I want to see a documentary that shows us the evolution from wads of tobacco to mm. seeds and gum. Well, I think you could start. Just, I think you could start the evolution with cigarettes, couldn't you? Yeah, you totally could. But I mean, <laughs> I want to know who made the decisions uh, to change. Wh- what motivated those changes? I mean, we we all know the party line about you know kids mm-hmm. chewing tobacco and all that. But there's got to be more to the story. Who are the players at the table? Whose righteous indignation drove this home? Was it like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, where there was a coalition of concerned mothers that were like hey listen and major league baseball went oh man i didn't think about that like so there's there's got to be a story uh there's probably multiple stories and they all coalesced into this wonderful change that took place i want to see that i would like to and Mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be a long drawn out documentary this is like a 30 40 minute feature short short form Mm -hmm. and i bet it would be a really interesting um like take on the whole thing and if and i want him to go all the way back to whoever was doing tobacco when pappy van winkle was doing whiskey right like start there (laughs) start (laughs) as far back as you can get (laughs) yeah because honestly that's something i looked up a few years ago because major league baseball came out with that rule where they couldn't have um dip cans in their back pocket when fans were in the stadium you know yep so i was like so where did this whole thing even start and it turns out it was because Guys didn't like that their mouth is getting dry on those sandlot fields out in the mm. middle of nowhere where they're playing. So they right. would chew tobacco to keep their mouth from getting dry. That's where that oh. comes is where that originally comes from. Um, See, that's but I am, great. But I am curious, yeah, like how you what you talked about, like how did that turn into seeds? Yeah. Right. And, and, and who started the seed trend? Was yeah. it a born of necessity? Was it like, well, I, I gotta do something? With my mouth, so what am I going to yeah. do? I don't want to be pink bubble gum, so mm-hmm. give me something else that's earthy. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And I, I'll tell I you, know. as a baseball coach, as somebody who's coached baseball, I eat seeds because of the stress. That's that, great. That that's like I have to have something to chew on, or else I'm going to chew my fingers or my hand, chew on my <laughs> face, <laughs> and you're yelling at all the little <laughs> nine year olds. Yeah, it keeps me from doing that because I'm like, I don't want to be the fool who's yelling at a kid and spitting and has seeds shooting out of his mouth while I'm yelling. So it keeps me me level ground instead. I just bite down on it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Very good insight. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, Can I do can I do an honorable mention real quick before I go into my last one? Of course. Yeah. Okay, so this is one that I think would, again, short form, um, okay. uh, doesn't need to be more than 35 to 40 minutes, maybe an hour tops, absolutely tops at an hour. But I want to see what it's like uh, to be a groundskeeper for a year, what a whole year is like. Like, start the documentary with the last pitch of the season, whether That's- it's the World mm. Series or the end of the season. So what do they go do? Do they what do they do? Take the field down? What do they do the next day? What do they do during the offseason to keep that grass green? How often in Seattle? How often are they opening the roof just to get natural rain on the grass? Right? Yeah. And and what are they doing in Texas when it gets scorching hot? Because you don't know. I mean, I don't know. But I don't know what kind of grass they use in Arizona. Maybe you could follow several grounds crews because you have so many different climates. And then end. End the documentary again with the last pitch of the season of the next season, and it starts all over again. I just got chills, bro. <laughs> that made my heart pitter patter. Did it? And that's my honorable yes. mention. That's my honorable mention break, bro, dude. That's amazing. That sounds <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you liked that one. Yeah, I think that would be really cool to watch just because I'm always fascinated with the with the grounds crew because I do not have a green yeah. a green thumb at all. And our buddy Ty, we need to bring Ty on sometime and talk about being a grounds yeah, crew do. member. Cause he has he was a member of the Salt Lake Bees grounds crew for a long time. First yeah. off, he's got stories. Second, I've got questions. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> so yeah, anywho. that's great. 
We have meant to have Ty on for sure. He's been busy. Yeah. He's got married, so he's very he's busy. Got, yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, he's a heck of a journalist. So that he, doesn't he matter. is. You know, he came in. He came into the newsroom one time. I was like, "Hey, I want to write sports." I was like, "Yeah, can I just send me a sample or something?" You know, whatever. And or no, I was like, "I was like, come cover this game with me." I was like, "I'll show you the ropes. You can write the story, whatever." He sent it to me. I was like, "Ty, this is better than anything I've ever, ever written in my life." He's like, "No, it's not." I was like, "Ty, legitimately better than anything I have or probably ever will write in my whole yeah. life." And he was twenty-one, and and winging like the it. First thing he, yeah, totally winging it. So yeah, uh, no, he's high as killer. enough. He's a fantastic writer. A big Agreed. Fan of time. All right, um, Brie, go ahead with your last one, then I'll do my last one after that. Okay, sounds good. I actually I went all the way on this one, and I even have a title. Oh, um, I want it to be called Switch, but. I want it to be a documentary about raising a switch hitter. I want to get the parents' perspective on what it's like. Obviously, we'll get the players' perspective because they'll be involved in the story, duh. But, um, you know, how did the players feel about the parenting? How did the parents make the decision? When did they spot the, tr- the talent? Um, was it something they forced? You know, how did they keep the kid motivated through all of the extra that goes in with? batting on both sides of the plate um literally double the work it is double the work and it's and it starts super super young so i want to know i want to watch it go all the way to the top and so i want to hear about bernie williams i want to hear about chipper jones uh roberto alomar pete rose eddie murray francisco lindor right some of the greatest um switch hitters ever and i mean obviously you got to talk about mickey mantle easily the greatest switch hitter of all time in my mind yeah but I mean, it's like that's what I I want to know. What is it like to be a parent, not just of a major league baseball player, but of a, a successful switch hitting major league baseball player? That's cool. Did Wilson bat left handed when you were here? No, he did the next no, time. Didn't. That's right. It was the next time. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Because he he said something about it that day. I was like, well, let's let's practice. <laughs> yeah that's part of what made me think of this idea actually was yeah, you and i like going, that yeah doing maybe, both maybe we'll, yeah. maybe we'll bring the camera out <laughs> yeah good idea <laughs> he probably would help to see it yeah it i would. show i show olivia her muay thai stuff when i take video and she watches yeah. herself and you know she's yeah. picking up stuff on from the third person yeah. i you actually know? showed him the other day i showed him a slow motion of a joey gallo home run oh, i was walking i was walking him through the swing I was like, see, this is what I'm saying here, here, and here. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And it was right before his last game in Brig Heat, and he went eight for eight his last two games. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty rad. <laughs> it's, it's super rad. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, the last one I have for you today. Okay. Um, this... So I want I want to know what happens to a city from the time that rumors of a team leaving begin to swirl mm. to that team is established in a new city. So like right now you could start that with the A's, right? It is starting. Yeah. Yeah, like you could start you could start filming that today with the A's. You would come in a little bit late, but you could still do it. Um, but the story I want is the Expos becoming the Nats. Now, I did find there was actually a documentary about the Expos, but I want to know what was going on in the front office, what was going on in the city for with the Expos in Montreal when they were getting ready to move them to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And then what was going on in the receiving city? What was going on in D.C. when they're like, we're getting ready to get a Major League Baseball team where the fans like, yes, yes, we're finally getting a baseball team back at the expense of this other city, but we don't care because we're getting a baseball team. Is Was that the attitude? Or is there a little bit of sympathy to Montreal because that was Canada's first Major League Baseball team? Yeah, it was. Right? So And on a successful run at, at the time of the strike. Mm-hmm. So it was, yeah. Yeah, so That's I'm curious what idea. it's like in both of those cities uh, when a team is relocated and then kind of the fallout in Montreal, what happened economically and things like that. And then the impact, like the economic impact that it had on DC bringing yeah. in the Nats. I'm really curious, especially since there's a team in Baltimore, just like right there. It's right there. So, yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. I like that a lot. 
cool, man. And how I much of it was some, like what's patriotic? Up? How much of it was driven by like it's America's baseball pastime, America's pastime, America's capital city doesn't have a ball club. Like you got to know there's somebody with that agenda in there. You would think so. Um, I thought that they would have, if that was the case though, I thought, I don't know, maybe they would have drawn more on the history and, and brought back the senators. Mm. Right. But I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. You've got the Ottawa senator. I don't know. I'm not sure. Good questions. See, this is why documentaries are great because there's so many questions and there are answers. You just got to find them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think, I think honestly, Brick, there's a few in here that we could do. We could do. Oh, yeah. (laughs) For (laughs) sure. Anyway, (laughs) like Brig said, if you want to get involved helping us get some of these projects off the ground, we actually didn't even touch on like the projects that we are planning on doing right. because for obvious reasons. Um, but if you want to help out with that, that's Patreon is the best way to do that. So jump on there. Like Brick said, five, 10, $15 uh, dollar tiers there and you get different benefits at each, but everybody gets the bullpen cut, which is something that we're incredibly proud of and have a lot of fun with between segments. It is fun just for you. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, concerns, Snyder remarks, go ahead and jump on baseball together.com and send those through the mailbag. There's a link in the, in the navigation wire there. You can also listen to the podcast or you can watch the podcast because I post it there every single week just for you. Go and tell them about the shop as well, Brig. You can jump on the shop at nine plus us.com N I N E P L U S U S.com. I'm wearing my uh, Bronx baseball together t-shirt with its fancy pinstripes on the bottom there. Brad has his uh, Heroes Get Remembered Legends Never Die t-shirt on as well. Very exciting. And uh, there's more. There's lots more, obviously, because that's the thing that we do is we have more of stuff. And it's bad. So it's too much. So <laughs> jump on there. Pick your favorites. And we will start culling from the masses and separating the wheat from the chaff uh, as soon as we get a chance. But you can do that at 9plusus.com and get yourself <laughs> some great baseball apparel (laughs) absolutely baseball family don't forget to like subscribe rate and review um let us know what you think about the podcast uh give us a rating wherever you can and don't forget to like i said subscribe wherever you can as well whether it's youtube or your podcast app but baseball family thank you again for joining us this week and we will catch you next week